today, wherever you are, however you are, and almost whatever you are, <laughs> you are one of seven. Literally. Your life, the person you are, the day you're living, the very existence that you have is one of seven types that are described in the scriptures that you fit into. Now the beautiful thing is, I don't know which one that is, and maybe you don't know which one that is, but God knows which one that is. <laughs> so you get to ask Him, seek Him, and find with Him which one of these seven types you fit into. And it's not an allegory, and it's not a metaphor, and it's not a simile, and it's not something that you know, is going to beat you up or stomp on you, because you see, it's Jesus the one who's saying it. Jesus said that you are one of seven. That he wrote to seven different types of churches and said, hey, look, you are one of these. You know, I'm going to write to each one of you, and we're going to cover it all. We're going to cover when you started to when you finished. We're going to cover where you are today to where you'll be tomorrow. Matter of fact, we're going to include every single person that is one of mine that I've called because I know who they are. I've called them and God has chosen them. And God knows who they are and by way of my spirit, I will lead them so that they'll know who they are. Because after all, many are called but few are chosen. But they could choose to follow the instructions that I'm giving them so that they could be chosen. And it's pretty simple to get chosen, actually, because all they got to do is be called, be chosen. And the way they're chosen is by doing what I said to do. Pretty simple. So you see, today you are one of seven different types of churches. You fit into one of these categories, one of these types, one of these similes or metaphors, if you want to call it that. But one of these literal churches that existed way back when in the beginning. Not the beginning of the world, but the beginning of when God designed the churches to be called out ones. To be people that were called by Him. That He would say, you're one of mine. He called them out. He called them church. In Greek they call it ecclesia and all kinds of weird things. You don't play with it, but literally it just simply means church. So whether you go to church, you know, and, you know, participate in evangelical or non-denominational or denominational, whether you're a Catholic, a Protestant, a Methodist, a Lutheran, a Episcopalian, a Baptist, a whatever Christian church, sorry Mormons, you just aren't Christian. That's another religion <laughs> and false. Um, sorry, just the way it goes, you got to be with Jesus, not the created Jesus you made up and kind of like somebody deceived you into believing. But the Son of God, having called seven churches, including Catholic, as much as people don't like to admit it, and Greek Orthodox, and Byzantine, and Armenian, and all these other Indians, all fit into seven types. And that's what all of Christendom is. Christendom is kind of a word that covers all of Christianity being the religious part and the relationship part, as well as just the historical part. So Christendom all fits into seven letters to seven churches. Pretty simple. Sometimes people make things too complicated. I don't know about you, but when I need a, you know, kind of a pick-me-up or a better understanding, I just go to the Word of God. It's kind of pretty straightforward. As a matter of fact, when I read the book of Revelation, I know people complain and they say, oh, it's too complicated, it can't be understood. And I think, well, wait a minute. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto you, to show unto his servants things which must surely come to pass. So, if he's looking at Revelation 1.1, 1 :1, if he's supposedly showing us these things that are to come to pass, I think he wants us to understand it. So we don't need someone to interpret it. We don't need someone to allegorically imply it. We don't need someone to make up things about it. I think it says what it means. It means what it says. 
hey, call me silly, but you know, when God wants to talk to me, he says, Michael, and I don't have to make up, you know, like, well, Michael who, Michael what, Michael where, Michael this, Michael that, Michael maybe, Michael could be, Michael seems to be. No, he means me, Michael, because he's talking to me. So, I don't know about you, but <laughs> I think if you just sat down with the Bible, just simple, hey, you know, and just read it, you know, especially the book of Revelation, which says it's meant to be understood, I think you'll understand it. I don't think you're going to have a big problem figuring it out. I don't think you have to get into some weird theologies and ideas that you might have heard from somewhere else. I think you could read just where it is, as it is, and get blessed by it. But maybe that's just me. But you see, I'm kind of simple, so I, I read it and I go, well, yeah, I understand that. That's pretty simple. You know, it kind of tells me where it's at, you know. And then when I look down and, you know, I was kind of blessed in my early days as a born again Christian, was that I was told, hey, you know what? If you want to know where you are in your walk with the Lord, read the letter Seven Churches. See which one fits you. That's where you are. If you're in that church or if you're in that state or that stage in your life, that's where you are. So you see, it applies first to who you are second to what stage of life you are and then third to what church you're in because you are a church literally you have the father son holy spirit in you and you got people around you so you're a church you, you know that come on now it can be applied to you know the church you participate in you know but it depends on whether you're really involved in what the church is doing or you're just kind of watching it from a distance so you know see how that works the things which are shall be and hereafter will be you know I mean those kind of things that are you know me you and them you know us we and they <laughs> yeah all of us together seven churches complete you know seven great I am's you know kind of you get it got it no then read it <laughs> if Jesus is kind of like saying hey I got some messages for you here they are then if he isn't talking to you I think you better figure out what's wrong because according to the book of Revelation he's talking to everyone and if you're left out there might be a problem <laughs> you might want to get that straightened out with God real quick you know I don't know you know I don't know how much time you got left you know and I don't mean with rapture I mean like hey I don't know about your driving or mine or you know what's going on in the world but God knows something could happen today and wouldn't want to shake up your world too much by suddenly ending it and you discovering it didn't end but the world goes on so to speak in your life once you die because suddenly you're standing in a place you don't know where it is or what it is and you don't know what to do because you didn't get ready for it before you got there so because you didn't get ready for it you're going to wind up in a place you don't want to go because that's where everybody goes that isn't ready for it got to deal with it now because you can't deal with it later so if this doesn't apply to you ooh, that's scary but because it does apply to all Christians that are called that are chosen that means that somewhere within these seven letters you get to sit down with Jesus and let his spirit lead you you know his spirit guides you his spirit tell you where you fit now I don't know where you fit I'm not gonna make it up you know I'm not gonna tell you where I fit you know that's my business <laughs> I don't know where you fit you fit somewhere but you fit whether you know it or not and everybody likes to say well you know I'm full of grace you know so I can do whatever I want to you know I found my place you know I'm just gonna accept that you know I'm saved no matter what you know well good now I like to work out my salvation with fear and trembling because I kind of go yeah, I'm saved by grace and I believe that and I don't believe that I have to do any works of righteousness in order to add to my, you know, redemption that Jesus has said that I have. But there's some point in time where Jesus says, you know, look, if you aren't doing what I said, then you really aren't mine and I don't know you and you don't know me and if I don't have a relationship with him, I want to make sure that I know him by way of having a relationship with him so that he's kind of like confirming to me that I'm doing what he said because if I'm not, kind of get cast out you know it's kind of like what the letters to the seven churches also talks about it kind of starts off with everybody in it 
but when he gets done with like some of the churches, it sounds like not everybody's with it, so not everybody gets it, and some of them get maybe not chosen. I don't know. You need to read it. I take it a little serious. So, because you're one of the seven, you know, you get a blessing, first of all, because you get blessed because you're reading it and you get to hear it. And you get to kind of like, you know, apply it to your life because it fits. You fit somewhere. And I know it's exciting, you know, where your church is at because they all sing songs and people go where they really enjoy feeling good at first. But sometimes you kind of need to balance out what feels good with what is good because lots of things feel good. But you got to find a place where God is good and he has called it good for you. And that's kind of what he does in these letters to seven churches. He kind of says, look, if this is where you're at, this is what I got that I think is good, and this is what I think is bad, and this is what you can do about it. So stay where you're at, wherever you're at. But develop, if it's a personal relationship thing, that you could develop from one stage in some of these churches to another stage, even though you may be stuck in some church that may be going to go into tribulation, sort of, you know, well, I can't mince the words, you'll read about it, and it's like, well, you know, you figure it out. If you think everybody's going to just take a short trip, you know, into the sky and just say bye-bye, okay. I don't think it says so, but okay. So let's figure it out, you and I. Let's figure out where we fit. Now, like I said, I have no idea where you fit. I have a hard enough time with where I fit because I'm pretty sure I know and I keep working on it. <laughs> but because we're one of seven, all we really need to do is read it and then figure it out for ourselves between God and you. Because you don't need to tell anyone because God's the one who's telling you. You don't need to argue with anyone because God's the one who's telling you. You don't need to point at someone else and say where they fit because God isn't telling you where they fit. God is telling you where you fit. And if the shoe fits, oh my God, your Jordans are showing where you are. Because <laughs> guess what? You may not be in the air with Jordan. <laughs> you may be on the ground, and I don't know if you've been playing around or what you've been doing, but according to whatever the word says in those letters to seven churches, you better do it. So let's look at it. Because chapter one kind of says, this is who's saying it, and this is what he's saying. You get it? So you can look at chapter 1 yourself and kind of go, okay, well, yeah, it's kind of straightforward. It does say what it means and it means what it says. Then you can get into chapter 2 where we start with the first church. See, the way to explain that, if you wanted to really understand, would be like a kind of revelation. You know, they put numbers in here in chapters, not where they fit, but where they thought it might work out. And they don't always get the chapters and verses together right. So if you took out all the chapters, you know, you could read it straight. But anyways, reading in chapter 1, verse 20, this explains what we're reading. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou saw in my right hand, and the seven gold candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches, or menorahs, as we know that they are. Because <laughs> they're not candlesticks. I mean... You know, it's kind of like a kind of a Gentile thing, you know. It's nice, but it just doesn't cut it, you know. It isn't quite the way they did things in those days. But it sounded good, you know, when King James was doing it, because after all, <laughs> it was in King James' time. <laughs> At least the word candlesticks. Now, menorahs is kind of like in Jesus' time. So you get the picture. And the first one of seven. Now, you listen careful, because this is where you either fit or don't fit, or your church fits or don't fit. Don't look at somebody else's church. Just remember, this is you and me. And i got to figure out where I am, and you need to know where you are, so you can let the Holy Spirit lead you wherever you need to go. Unto the church, or unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works and your labor, and I know your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne 
and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto you quickly, and I will remove your candlestick out of this place, except you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You know, people like to go with that church thing until they read the last line, and then you go, to him. Oh, you mean the individual people in the church? Yeah. So it's kind of like, see what I'm saying about it's you, and then it's also the church you're in? So if you're in the church of the Ephesians, Ephesus type, you know, that was a literal church in the old days called Ephesus, that is a literal church today, that's like Ephesus, one of them around here somewhere looks like Ephesus and acts like Ephesus and I'm not going to give you Ephesus because guess what, Ephesus is Ephesus and Ephesus is well, where, is well able to be understood just by you reading it and figuring it out God will tell you or, also, it's a type of process that in the early church, yeah, they kind of acted like this, and they went through these ages that kind of fits, but it doesn't fit perfectly. So you could use that as a church age, like some have done through the process of, you know, development, you know. Or you could use it as your personal development, that, you know, when you had your first love, you know, you're kind of excited, and then you kind of went, you know, did wonderful, looks like this, wonderful works and wonderful labors, and you had great patience, you know, and... You couldn't stand evil, you know, and then you kind of went, you know, and tested the things to see who were apostles or, you know, good pastors, if you want to call it that, or good teachers or good Bible scholars, you know, and you kind of had maybe a little little stage of finger pointing, you know, and you kind of like, ew, 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 and then you started going, they're bad, they're bad, they're bad, telling other people, but that might have been like, you know, getting a little distracted, you know. You know, and you found that, you know, those people that were like, ooh, you know, ooey, were liars, you know, and it kind of came out, you know, in the wash through time, you know. And then you got older and, you know, you, you kept patient with your faith, you know, you grew and you kept going on with it, you know, with God, you know. And then you kind of like, you know, worked the jobs that God gave you and did the things that God told you to do and you didn't give up on it, you know, you, you kept going, you know, and you were very persistent at it. You know, but the only thing is, is that you were very persistent in a religious way, in a very good dogmatic way, but you kind of forgot Jesus along the way, you know, or whatever your first love was. You see, I would like to say that this means Jesus, but it doesn't say Jesus, so I don't know what it means. What's your first love, you know? If God is talking to you like in a stage in your life, maybe your first love was your first wife. I don't know, you know, maybe you need to go back and talk to her, you know, or something. I don't know. However, God's telling you, you go do what God tells you to do, you know. But my point is, is, hey, you know, remember where you were fallen and repent. It usually means Jesus, but, you know, for some people right now, maybe they, they kind of like, you know, need something else for the Lord right now. But it says, remember from whence you were fallen and repent and do the first works. You know, just, you know, start from square one. You know, it's no big deal. People do it all the time, you know. They start over, get back to the beginning, and go on with it. But he says, make sure you do it or I'll remove the candlestick, which simply means that if he takes it out, you're no longer there. You're no longer with him. You're without him. So it's kind of a serious message to whoever this is written to. So if it's written to you, you know, he doesn't say you're out of it yet. He says, you've done lots of religious neat things, you know, and you're very good at it. You're very precise at it. You're very actually accurate, you know. You just kind of like left Jesus on the outside, you know. And you need to bring him on the inside. <laughs> and get involved with him a little more. So it's not such a bad thing because there's always good. And it's not such a good thing because there's not always bad. But it's kind of the thing you need to do. You know what I mean? So if that's one of seven that fits you, then let it be so. As it is written, let it be so and you do what God tells you to do because he says... To him that overcometh. So if you overcome these things, you know, which frankly, you know, kind of like the overcoming part is a little tough because I think 
that's kind of like a warning of where you're heading, but okay, you'll figure that one out on your own. So going on to number two of seven, because <laughs> I don't know where you are at number one of seven, but I could fit that. You know, I can see that in my life at different times. I've been there, done that, went, ooh, I don't like that. So I kind of went, I want to go the opposite extreme. I want to kind of set aside some of this stuff, and I want to go back to square one. You know? I've done that at times in my life. So if it fits, wear the shoe. If it don't fit, hey, try out another coat. <laughs> you know what it's like when the clothes fit. You know when they fit. You know. I don't know. You could be wearing those pants hanging down to your, you know, ankles, you know, and think that fits, but you know when it fits or not. Number two, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and your tribulation, and I know your poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested and tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Ooh, second death. That's kind of like, you know, separation, you know, kind of like, you know, condemnation or confirmation. <laughs> so, it's kind of like, you know, in this second one, you know, you kind of go, man, you know. I know your works, you know, you work good, you know, and I know what you've been through, and I know how you're poor, you know, you're just kind of like working it, you know. But some of you, you know, like, hey, you've been martyred, you know, and you're going to be martyred. And frankly, that's kind of where you're going, you know. Kind of like into that stage that's kind of like a martyrdom stage, and if God wants you to die, let it be so. Blessed are they that, you know, die because you won't be subject to the second death because you were faithful and you overcame. A lot of people, you know, like to make this only apply in the past. Like I said, you know, hey, I don't see it. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't want to be a part of this, but it seems pretty simple to me. If God's writing it to me today, it means for today. If he isn't writing for me today, I might as well throw the whole Bible away because then it doesn't apply. But I think you know that today, one of these seven applies. And this just might be the one you're in. You might be in a foreign country, or you might be in America. It doesn't matter which country you're in, because this could apply to lots of different ways that God uses it to speak to you today. So how are we speaking to you? That's what you should do. And the third one, which I hope I keep, all third, third, keep them in order, because if I don't, then I'll have to go back and figure it out. <laughs> and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know your works, and where you dwell, even where Satan's seed is, and you hold fast my name and has not denied my faith, faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication, that ain't good. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent or else I will come unto you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying, He that receiveth it. Sounds like some pretty specific stuff. Sounds like some pretty straightforward warnings, like, 
a bunch of junk got involved, you know, like the sin of Balaam, you know, and the doctrine of Balaam, and, you know, like things sacrificed to idols and committing fornication, a whole bunch of junk in there. I think if you wanted to ask God, He could tell you what they are. I think I know what they are, but that's for you and God to kind of like, you know, work it out because, no offense, when they get into the doctrine of Balaam, you know, it's kind of like, there's a lot involved there. It wasn't just Balaam said, you know, because Balaam was a prophet of God. Literally. He spoke God's word. God used him. Which sounds strange to people because they say, well, but didn't he kind of like blow it? Yeah. But when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he was used by God. That's how people in this life can appear being used by God and still be wrong in what they're doing. Because God may use that vessel for dishonor in the end that he used for a purpose at some point in time. And sadly, they made them showing that you could take the abusiveness of using God for their own gain. Maybe that applies to some of what this applies to in regards to Jesus talking about it. You know, because a lot of people that tend to use God for their own gain seem to fall into things sacrificed unto idols, you know, they start making up these idol things, you know, that they get involved in, you know, they love the world, and they love their cars, and they love their money, and they love their Harleys, oops, did I say Harleys? They love this, that, and the other thing, and they get involved in it, you know, special cruises, special, oops, did I say that too? Never mind. <laughs> Grace applies to whatever it applies to, hey, you know, God bless you, that's it. Or, you know, to commit fornication, you know, which, that is like, of course you don't do that, you know what I mean? But there are some people that maybe they are prophets of God, you know, that have some mega ministry out there that really, you know, do heal people, really do cause salvations, but they also are fornicators and into all this other junk too. And literally God says, repent, or I'll come and fight against you again with the sword of my mouth, meaning literally my word will contradict you. Because God won't take the gift away, or the ability, but his word will reveal whether they be of God or not. And it will fight against them every time that they are out there. It will just be a testimony against them. The word of God himself will be that witness. Whew. So, hey, you know, maybe, maybe it applies to the church you're in, and you just want to get out of it and say, probably a good idea, or... Maybe God wants you to stay there. But it says that he that hath here and none here, the Spirit says to him that overcometh. So ask God how to overcome that if you're in that kind of ministry or in that kind of church or in that setting. Three, I think. I think we're on three. But we'll just keep, because I'm not keeping track of the numbers, we'll just keep reading them and then you can figure it out if it's three, four, five, or six, or seven. So I'm hoping this is three. <laughs> and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira is right. These things say the Son of God, who got my attention, who hath his eyes like unto the flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know your works, and charity, and service, and faith, and your patience, and your works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you, because you suffer that woman, Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon another burden, but that which you have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken into shivers, even as I received of my father. 
and I will give him the morning star, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Sometimes people read that, and they see to them, obviously, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, the papacy, so to speak, meaning that that doctrine that came in of the Marianol and Mary this and Mary that and the beads and you know all the different things that were the scapulas and kind of the the integration of all these other things that seem to be idol worship that were patterned after some of the idol worship that's in Judaism, you know, like the tefillin and and the amulets, you know, that Jews have, you know, and the the mysticism that got into Judaism that you know, Catholics at times imitated in their own going off on tangents. Sometimes people see that in this letter to the churches, you know, and say, well, Great Tribulation is the Great Tribulation. That's one church going into Great Tribulation. It's kind of obvious to me, but maybe it means something else to you. <laughs> okay. For me, it's kind of like, well, you know, I kind of see, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, one aspect of it being, yeah, you know, that kind of dogmas that they made up, you know, and got involved in, and kind of those sects that are wrong. But the other hand, I see the good, because God is still with it, God is still in it, God still tells them to overcome. And so I don't see, like some people do, all Catholics not being saved. It's like baloney. That's baloney. Personal relationship, personal relationship, don't matter whether you're Catholic, Protestant, whatever. Now, I don't see it only as a Roman Catholic Church because there are lots of, like you could get into the Greek, you know, and see that they've got huge iconoplasts, you know, this whole worship the icon over the I person, you know, instead of the personage, it's the icon of it. And then I see it in evangelicalism too because also in the women of it, you know, so to speak, there are different aspects in inside of evangelical stuff that's kind of like, you know, they get a little carried away into some weird stuff, you know, presents, gold dust, you know, kind of some weird idol stuff that gets, you know, kind of like satanic stuff involved, you know. You kind of go, well, you know, can't we just stick with what, you know, if we're in this church, instead of the woman Jezebel, you know, kind of like tempting everyone around, you know, couldn't we just stick with the basics, you know, which is what Jesus says? I'm the Son of God, follow me. I think we could do that if you're in that kind of setting. That if you're, you know, if you're a Catholic or you're an evangelical or a Protestant or you're whatever you are, you know, in, in uh, Pentecostalism or, you know, whatever off the wall thing you've gotten off the wall on, even Seventh day Adventists, which have gotten way down the road on some, some things that are like off, you know, like they worship the Sabbath, you know, and worship the seventh day. That's wrong. You know, I mean, pardon me, but you don't worship a day. You know, you don't get it to where it's bigger than the Son of God. So that too could be like the woman because who brought it in? You know, Ellen, I think G. White was kind of like into all that kind of stuff. You know, and it's kind of like on the one hand brought some good things, but on the other hand, you know, didn't. So part of what maybe her ministry was was good, and part of it was kind of like, uh oh. -uh. So. Really, when you read these letters, just do what Jesus says. Because if you're in that kind of ministry, you know, kind of like, you know, whatever Jezebel is for you, go read what Jezebel was, you know, and then read what, you know, this says, and then kind of like, don't do what it tells you not to do, and do what it tells you to do. See? Jesus really is the answer for the world today, and he's the answer in all of these letters to the seven churches. So whichever one fits for you, if the shoe fits, if the clothing you wear or the robe you put on is that. Even these Messianic Jews that have gone religiously legalistic, wrong. They have worshipped Torah in such a way that they make it into an idol. Just the same way that Hasids have done it in some ways by making it more important than God himself. Although they don't admit it, they do act it. And sometimes it's like even laying tefillin and kind of like binding your hands and your head. It's just not there. It's not true. It's not accurate. It's false. Follow what Jesus says, and you'll figure out which church you're in. It's amazing when you read it, too, because you go, they're that far off, and they're in the church? Wow. And they're still saved? Man, Lord, you have perfect grace and mercy, don't you? You really wait a long time. Seven types.
And unto the church in Sardis, which I think this is four, maybe, <laughs> four or five. I could lose count. And unto the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You know, I love this verse, or this, this one of um, Sardis, because people tell me that, you know, Jesus doesn't know when the rapture is, or when, you know, that he's coming, where I always thought that it was like he didn't know when he was here, when he told us, but when he got to heaven, God told him because it was this revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him to reveal to his servant. So God gave him what he needed to know so that he could tell us, because that's what he did in the book of Revelation. Now, you know, okay, you know, maybe I'm just a little weird, you know, and maybe, maybe I read things, you know, literal too much and too literal about it. <laughs> Doesn't specifically say so, okay, but I kind of go down here and I think, you know, man, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I'll come out to you as a thief, you know, I was like, hmm, sounds like a thief in the night to me, man, you know, but okay, maybe you guys just weren't raised the same way I was and I look at things a little differently. I'm not going there, but if it blessed you, great, you can take that and run with it <laughs> and be ready. <laughs> watch out. This might be for those that are, you know, watching for the Lord's return and kind of like, huh, you know, ding ding. But, you know, I kind of like read these things and I always get parts of it where I know it fits me. So that's why I always treat it as, you know, I need to do that too as part of some of the other ones. And I need to do part of this one too. And I just make all of it fit me, you know, all seven parts because I feel like I'm part of all of it. But maybe that doesn't apply to you. So if you're stuck here in Sardis, you know, and you're going through this Sardis stage or maybe you're in a church that is Sardis, you know, there's a few people that are okay, you know, in your church, you know. You probably are one of them. You know, it just says that remember and received and heard and hold fast what you had, you know. Somewhere in the beginning you were right, but you need to turn back to Him so you'll be all right. You see what I'm saying? You started right, and to be all right, you turn to Him. You're always all right if you turn to God, meaning Jesus. But if you turn away from Jesus, you really aren't going to hear what He's saying to the letters of the seven churches. So if you reject it, then I don't know what to tell you because it's kind of like he says, hey, I got the Spirit. You don't got the Spirit. I got all seven. And I don't know when people tell me about, you know, like what they understand the Spirit of God to be. <laughs> but I ain't going there because sometimes when people ask me questions, well, what's, you know, what literal scripture does it say that the Spirit of God is a person? And I go, I don't know, but, you know, they just used a lot of scriptures to say that because, frankly, when I read it, I go, I look at seven spirits and I'm kind of like, I'm not going to confuse the Trinity at all because I know it's Father, Son, and Spirit. But what the Spirit is, I ain't going there. If he's seven spirits, I'm content with seven being one and one being seven, and that's all I'm going to say about it because there's a whole big Jewish side that would go, yeah, <laughs> and there's a whole big Christian side that goes, we're not going into ten or nine somehow because that's six and three and you know three and God and man and God and man being revealed in the same thing being you know kind of like God Father Son Spirit and the Spirit being we won't go there so it's kind of like well there's three in one so that's it's but could there be like of the one seven in one don't make me to be heretic I don't read this I just read it the way it says and I go. That's what it says to me, you know, I can't explain it, but what I can't explain, I don't know, but as far as I'm concerned, when it says Spirit of God, Spirits of God, I'm leaving it at seven Spirits of God, you know, it ain't symbolic, it ain't weird, it ain't wonderful, it ain't marvelous, it ain't dumb, it ain't stupid, it ain't whatever, it is what it is, the way it is, 
if God says there's seven spirits of God, I'm saying there's seven spirits of God. And that's all I can leave it at. You know, when you want to go Holy Spirit of God, fine, that says Holy Spirit of God. When you want to go Spirit of God, you know, like in Revelation, you know, or Genesis, the beginning, Spirit of God hovered over the waters, you know, Spirit of God. You know, I'm not going to go anywhere with what it says except for what it says, where it says. Because believe me, there's enough that's really mind-boggling if you ran with it, which people don't want to do. <laughs> Because they kind of like rather stick with what people tell them rather than just read it. Because when you read it, you go, ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> when you want to know, well, that's bigger than we are. You know? That's why God's in control and we're not. Because if we let man be in control, man, he'd have these seven letters to seven churches all confused <laughs> instead of just reading it. So if you're in Sardis, do it. You heard it. You can reread it. You know how. And to the next one, which is either six or seven, I mean, five or six, I think it's six, because I think there's only one more after that. Let's get ahead, so just so I can see. Yeah, this is, I think, six. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. He that hath the key of David, he that opens, and no man shuts, and shuts, and no man opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. For you have a little strength, and you have kept my word, and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, and do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the, come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You know, everybody loves this one, you know. Now, me personally, you know, I think that's the only church that, quite frankly, says isn't going into the tribulation period. Pardon me, but it's the only one that I see, but, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but it kind of says something about, like, you know, um, because you kept the word my patience, I'll keep you from the hour of temptation which I come upon the all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. You know, hour of temptation, that's kind of, I don't know, you know, it's like, maybe that isn't great tribulation, but it's on the whole world. <laughs> maybe there's some other hour of temptation that's coming. When in heaven's silent, <laughs> you know, maybe for one hour God doesn't talk to us and we all freak out. It's the only other time I know God talks about an hour, you know, but anyways. Some hour of temptation, which people don't really like to explain too much, but okay, maybe somebody did to you and you've got some weird interpretation. I just like to say, hey, look, it's come upon the whole world to try them and it's supposed to be trying them, you know, and it says that, you know, he'll take us and, you know, make us, make whoever is in this church, you know, with a new name and new heaven go to be with Jesus. I think that's kind of like, you know, people like to say it's the church at the rapture. And then they go, oh, but there was real quick, you know, we got to wrap this up so the last letter to the seven churches only fits for seven and a half years. You know, it's the last thing that's, you know, the church, you know, the church age. You know, the only problem with that idea about church age is that if the church is gone then the last church wouldn't fit today. It would be people that were going from stage to stage to stage, then it wouldn't be church ages. So you see how that kind of dispensationally kind of doesn't go like really processing through all the way unless the church does remain and then we have to reevaluate that rapture idea. Because you see, I have a personal belief in the pre-tribulation rapture. I also know for a fact there's absolutely no way everybody goes in the rapture. It doesn't happen. I know people teach it. I know people preach it. But 
the very simple thing says two shall be in the field, one shall be taken near the left. And those aren't two people that were like, you know, if they're walking together, it's not like one sinner and one saint. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, 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 no. That means that it's a 50% rapture rate, you know, sort of. But it does mean that we don't use the word partial rapture, but we don't say quite what we should be saying, which is not everyone goes. And that's what the reality is. We're supposed to pray to be counted worthy. So when you read something like this, you kind of go, well, that's cool. Out of six churches, we got one that it kind of looks like, you know, they're going to miss it, you know. But the rest have to go through kind of, you know. You see what I'm saying? Maybe you might want to re-examine these, you know, if you're just talking about the rapture only and see where that fits, if it does. Maybe it doesn't to you. But then maybe you didn't ask the right questions about how does the last church fit if the rapture is the end of the church age. Good question. So, in this, it says that they were the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, but do lie and make them to come and worship before your feet. I mean, there's all kinds of blessings here and an open door, you know, and all kinds of neat stuff, you know, and I'm like, cool. While I may want to be there, I would have to, God, have to ask God to take me there, to process me, to make me fit into that category. Because, you see, you can't go to where you don't know. If God doesn't say you're there, then you are. So you need to do what God tells you to do and then ask Him to, as He said, He could pick up one of those, you know, candelabras or menorahs, you know, and move it out. Well, if He could pick up that menorah, which is a church, which is also you, and move it out of His place, He could pick you up and put you in His place. In other words, He could take you out of one place and put you in another. He could literally just say, hey, angel, I'm transferring this guy from Pergamus to Sardis, and now a couple years I'm going to transfer from Sardis to Philadelphia. Hey! Or you could just ask God to do it, and he'll do it himself. I mean, literally, come on, let's be real. Isn't that how it works? I mean, with God, he could, and he can, and he does. Because it's really your heart. And all God's trying to do in these letters to seven churches is tell you where you're at today and what he wants you to do today. So it keeps saying, Today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart as it says provocation, but it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear of the Spirit, saith unto the churches. And he's saying, Look, I'm talking to everybody. There ain't nobody left out of this one. Everybody fits somewhere if you're part of my body of Christ. But if you're not part, you're not part of the body of Christ, then you're not part of my church. You're not part of me. Because he said he would cast them out and remove that one completely. So you see, you're really in it or you're out of it completely. So if you're in it, then you could ask him to take, him where, take you where he wants you to be. And you could learn and develop and become part of a different church or wherever he chooses to place you or stage you're going through. So... In that one, you know, it's a blessing and you should read each one and study and kind of like, you know, work it out. And Maybe you do want to talk to other people and pastors and teachers and elders and deacons and find out where you are, you know, what you're doing and what your church is doing, you know, because frankly, if your church is kind of like, you know, in Philadelphia, stay where you're at. <laughs> study, become like your church because your church is meant to inspire you to become like it as well as it becomes like Jesus. So you kind of follow along the way. You don't just sit there and sit back and watch and see what people do but rather you become the church itself. And the last one, and unto the angel, pretty sure it's the last one, it is, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you, buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. 
To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Well, I look at that and see a lot of where, yeah, this could be written to those that are like inside of the Great Tribulation and they're like, you know, behold, I sent the door, he'll come inside, you know. But a lot of people that talk about the church then exclude that possibility when they talk about the rapture because they say, no, it doesn't work that way. It's just tribulation, martyrdom kind of thingy, you know. Well, yeah, I think it says that, you know, be the else that are for repent. So I don't see this as just process of only a dispensational, you know, church age, you know, historical, you know, and that we're living in the, the Laodicean age, you know. But rather, this applies all the time. You know, it applies then, it applies now, and it applies what shall be thereafter. What is, was, and shall be. And that's what Jesus said at the beginning of the book of Revelation. He says it all the way through. It's kind of a key to open up things and understand it. Because God doesn't really deal in time the way we do. He deals with all as now. So when it was back then, it was now. When it was 10 years ago, it was now. When it's today, it's now. And when it's tomorrow, it's still now, as far as God is concerned. So that's how it applies to you today. That's how it applies to the church today. That's how it applies to me today. And that's how it applies to everyone always. Because it involves all those things as well as the process that you're going through. So if you found yourself that you're far from God, then yeah, you need to do what it says. You know, buy gold tried in the fire. You know, you're going to go through it. You're going to have to like, you know, kind of like clean up your act. Get straightened out. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow Jesus. Find that you have fallen so far away that really you need to repent today. You really need to stand for God in a very real way. Because without those robes of white raiment, without there being salvation for you, you've actually brought yourself to a place of uh, nice religion, but where's God? In other words, if God ain't in it, then God's out of it. And if God needs to ask to come into your heart or come into the door or knock at it, then you pushed him away so far that you need to ask him today to come back in and take over so that he's leading and you are. This applies to everything, by the way. It doesn't apply to just you know one church or another. It can apply to you by pushing him out of whatever area of life you're in. It can apply to you to being so you know religious zealot that you no longer are led by the Spirit of God. You're led by your own idea of God. It can apply to the Pentecostal, the Protestant, the Catholic, the Methodist, the Messianic, the Christian. The, you name it. Put a name there and it applies. Because it's the Word of God and it's Jesus speaking. So in the last two seven churches, somewhere, somehow, you fit. That's the good news. Welcome. You're part of the church. You're part of those that are called by God. You've been chosen by Him for salvation. You've been redeemed, or you're going to be redeemed by Him when He comes again, and He's going to choose you as either a vessel Ron or a vessel wrath. Because we saw that, you know, Balaam may have been a prophet, but guess what? <laughs> His prophet went into profiteering rather than being blessed by God, and he chose to go the opposite way and may have lost his salvation, so to speak, if he had it. But God used him anyways. So don't be like Balaam, but rather be like what Jesus tells you to do today, to follow him, to hear his voice, to seek to be led by the Spirit of God, so that you're not led by men, you're not led by me, you're not led by you, you're not led by what you think, you're not led by interpretations, you're not led by symbol. Sim symbiotic relationships of allegory, similes, and similitudes, but rather you're led by the Word of God as it speaks to you. The Bible has God speaking verbally to you as you can hear His voice and He knows those who His is. You are one of His. He will talk to you. He will reveal to you. He will show you these things as He promised in the book of Revelation. He would. You sit down and read it. You are one of the seven. Literally, one of them. You're not all of them. <laughs> Although I, sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, this part's like one, this part's two, this part's three, this part's four, this part's five, this part's six, this part's seven. That part's seven. 
Who knows? No, but the reality is you're one of seven. So as one of seven, make your calling and election sure. Rejoice that God is speaking to you, but also take serious what God is doing with you so that you will be found in him as one of the not only called, but chosen to be unto him for his glory, that he should say unto you, well done, you overcame. Because almost all of them overcame in some way. He that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying. So, as the Lord is speaking to you, figure out between you and him which one of the seven you are.